Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I want to welcome everyone to our Wednesday night Bible study. Thank you for coming. My name is Pastor Gary Mack here at Shallow Baptist Church. One church in two locations where our senior pastors, the Reverend Dr. James Allen Duncan. Can we give the Lord a praise? I'm glad to see everyone back with me again. Thank you for joining with us uh, here in Bonn and Port Norris. You know, we have two locations. And you can you can enter, be entertained. But we have an entertainment tonight. We're going to dig into the Word of God. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. And we're going to have a great time in the Lord. You can reach us on Facebook as well as YouTube. Our YouTube channel, SBC Praise Church. SBC Praise Church and also Facebook and Instagram. And we do have a word for you this evening. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. And the title is called, It's Not What It Looks Like. It's Not Over. It's Not What It Looks Like. It's Not Over. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, our Lord and Savior, we just want to thank you again for another opportunity. As we come together as a family, as a unit, Lord, to lift up your name, because you alone, God, are worthy of all the praise. And as I join with my brothers and sisters across the airway, Lord, we just give you praise for who you are and what you are in our life, Lord. Lord, you've been good to us, Lord. You have brought us from a mighty long way. And for that, we give you glory. We celebrate this evening. 7 o'clock Bible study to give you praise. As we break bread together, as we share the word together, Lord, Lord, be with us, protect us, clear our minds and hearts so we can receive what thus saith the Lord. Can we give the Lord a praise? Amen, 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 amen. We're going to dive right into this. I'm going to do a little recapping for where we started off last week because for those who aren't watching, I hope you can go ahead and watch it on YouTube. Or, you know, look for it, find it. It's not what it looks like. So many times in our lives, we base our emotions, we base our feelings on what we actually see instead of what we know in Christ. Talk to believers right now. Um, I, I want to I share something with believers. We got to do a better job. We got to um, do some self evaluations of our own self and let the world know we're supposed to be the light. Shining in the midst of dark. We both be that one on the hill, letting our light shine so the world can see. But the what the world has been seeing in believers is, is no hope. No strength that God can get us out. So we need to do a better job of believing what God said, who we are, and through the word of God. Amen? And we're going to talk about something. This is our scripture that we built this title off of. Luke 23, 42. You know the story it was doing the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there was two thieves on the cross. And here's what one of the thieves said. We're going to start here and we're going to dig into um, the meat of the word uh, a little bit later. And one of the thieves said unto Jesus, verse 42, chapter 23, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when I come into thy kingdom. We talked about that last week, and I showed the picture. If you look right behind me, if you look at the picture, I want to give you a, a vivid, so in your, imagination, in your imagination, I want to give you a vivid picture of Jesus being crucified on the cross. Now, let me tell you, this is a little, this is a little, this is not too bad. But the Bible tells that his body was beaten so bad he was unrecognized. It looked like a human. In this picture, it's not as bad. I want you know the power of the story. Jesus Christ hung on a cross between two three thieves. They deserved to die. Remember in the story in the same chapter, Luke chapter twenty three, uh, the thieves said we deserve to die, but this man, one of the thieves, said this man done nothing. He don't deserve to die with us. And he was marched, when Jesus, before he came to the cross, he was marched from Judgment Hall to Judgment Hall, to Pilate, to King Herod, back and forth. And they said, we find no fault in this man. Talked about it last week. And King Herod, looking forward to seeing this Jesus, who the, who the um, people in the region was talking about, all over about the man that opened up blind eyes, and he could do all these great miracles. And King Herod said, bring him to me, I want to see him. I want him to perform a miracle. 
in front of me. I want to see if there's any truth to what y'all been saying about this man. And there you find Jesus on the cross. That's all of that. As I've been marched from judgment hall to judgment hall, you find Jesus here hanging between two thieves. It looked like a doom and gloom moment. Have you ever had a doom and gloom moment in your life? Where things seemed to be falling apart, seemed like the enemy was getting the best of you? Seemed like the victory belonged to him instead of you, and you were the believer? It not, it's not what it looks like. Don't get confused about what you see. You gotta be, you gotta be in tune for what God has promised you. This story is not over. Even though it looked like Christ had been defeated and the enemy has won. When you see him on the cross, it looked like the devil won. He was Jesus on the cross. Hopeless. But I went through scripture and told you, we, we go over those scriptures again. I want to recap and then I'll get to what we're going to talk about tonight. There's a lot of things I want to go over tonight and I ask you to pray that we won't move too fast because I need you to get this. Uh, these are some things I was telling you. We need to first know who we are in Christ. Uh, we talked about John 15 that he didn't, we didn't choose him but he chose us. Uh, not only did he choose us, he chose us to bear fruit. The meaning of our life that we live since we accepted Jesus Christ and our Lord and Savior. There's some things we ought to be able to do different. There's some, some victories we ought to have in our life. And as Christians, we forget that he chose us. We think we chose him. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I didn't wake up in the morning and say, hey, I want to serve the Lord. I wasn't looking for him. But what I was looking for is how to get out the mess that I was in. A lot of us find ourselves in a bad situation where it looks better than what it is. But I come to tell you, just like the story wasn't over with Jesus Christ on the cross, your story is not over either. I know some pastor back. I know you're talking about the cross. What does this have to do with? I'm telling, I'm telling you right now. How did this apply to your life? Jesus was hanging on the cross, but he had a bigger purpose. He had to take sin upon himself. Your sin and this and the world's sin. He had to take it upon his shoulder. He had to take it upon the cross in order to accomplish what his purpose was. He came, the book of Luke. To seek and save those who are lost. That was his mission. To seek and save us. Luke 19 10. For the Son of Man come, for no other reason but to seek and to save those which were lost. His purpose, 1 John 3 and 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. We're not going to stay there long. I just want to touch on a few things that we went over last week and then we're going to go right ahead. Because Jesus. Because of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.22. For he was made, who, he who knew no sin, excuse me, he who knew no sin, he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. We talked about that. you got to know that you are the righteousness of God. If you accept Jesus Christ truly as your Lord and Savior, I'm talking about confessing with your mouth and believing with your heart. You got to know that you have been, because of what he did on the cross, what he accomplished, now you are the righteousness of God. Meaning you stand in right standing with God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. That's something to be thankful for. We belong to him. Take heed therefore unto yourself and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. We talked about that. The power of his blood. When I, If I get a cut and blood come out of me, that blood ain't good for nothing. But to get a band-aid or get some type of bandage and cover it up so I can get a healing process. But when he shall shed his blood, his blood, his blood reached so far into our lives. When we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity and on our way to hell, his blood redeemed us. He purchased us. He paid a price for us. I, I wish believers would get together and just give God praise right where you are, wherever you listen to me at. We need to just give God a wave off and open our minds and say, Hallelujah, Lord, we thank you for purchasing us, purchasing us with your precious blood. Yeah, it looked bad. It looked doom and gloom on the cross, but it was not in vain, but it was to the glory of God. 
because it served a purpose. And the reason why you or me are here right now, the reason why we can come into the church and fellowship and give God praise is because of what he's done. He, he gave us a roof, clothes, and a shelter over our heads and clothes on our back, all because of what he has done. He gave us a right that we could come boldly before the throne of grace and we could call on him. We don't need nobody to intercede for us or speak on our behalf. We could come unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let me skip that. I'm going to go through this. We, we, we talked about being sealed. We talked about uh, he took our place. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man has come to minister, to be ministered unto, but to minister. He didn't come to be ministered unto. He came to minister, and he gave his life for many, a ransom for many. For even the Son of Man, Mark 10, 45. For the Son of Man come, not to minister unto you, but to minister and come. I just read the same thing. That's just a different uh, gospel, another view. The resurrection power, we talked about that in St. John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. We talked about Jesus said, no man take up my life. I need to set the stage for those who didn't hear last week. I'm setting the stage. You got to know the power that your your Savior possesses, and because the power he had, he left us power. So we're not powerless when the enemy comes and try to get us to look at our story or what we might be going through or what we might be going through on our job or whatever sickness we might be carrying in our body. We got to know that the power of God. We have the power to pray unto our Lord and Savior, because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. And we have that connection with him. And we got the authority to be able to speak to our situation. According to Mark chapter 11, verse 22. It says, have faith in God. And then they go along about asking for forgiveness. But it said, when you ask for forgiveness, you got to make sure you believe what you pray for. Because God expects some things out of us as leaders, as believers. He expects us to make a change. He expects us to be different. He expected to handle the situation different because of what he did. We didn't have to pay the price for our sin. He did. So he gave us authority through his word. That's why his word is so important to us tonight. We got to make sure we know who we are. We got to know who he is. He said, no man take up my life. But I lay it down. I lay it down. I got the power to pick it back up. Meaning the enemy has no authority over our Lord and Savior. And he has no authority over those that believe in him. Book of John, chapter 14, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. Why? Because of what he done. The price that he paid. The journey that he came and took. He dwelled among us. According to St. John, chapter 1, verse, 10, verse 14, he dwelled among the people. He came down here on earth so he could experience what we go through. There's nothing the Lord, our Lord and Savior, don't know of our infirmities. So when we pray, he understands. He's been there. He's been hungry. He's been mistreated. He's been talked about. He's, he went through all the experience that we go through in life. And it says, he said not. Because he had a purpose. What's your purpose? What does God has for you? What is your role in life? God gifted you with a gift, and he wants you to use it to his glory, because his glory will save your family. <laughs> his, his, his glory, his purpose is going to provide for you, bring provision, life, and strength. And even when you do, do go through trouble, and you will go through trouble, you will go through trials and tribulations, according to St. John chapter 16, 33. For in this life you shall have trouble, trials and tribulations. But be with the cheer because of what he done. I'm talking to somebody here. Don't take for granted what Christ has done for us. Don't come to church and just give God praise a little phony worship and forget about what he experienced on the cross. It looked as bad. It looked like he was defeated. But behind the scene, he had already made peace with the Savior, with God, his Father. And he opened a door that we can have a relationship with him. We can cry out, Abba, Father, which are in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. I'm talking to somebody here. 
We need to step back and, and look at how grateful we need to be for what our Lord and Savior done for us. We went back to the text uh, that we started out with. It was at the beginning of the, the PowerPoint. Luke 23, uh, verse 32. The two criminals. There were two other men, both criminals, that were also led to be crucified or executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with these two thieves. And one of the thieves, one on the right and one on the left, Jesus said these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was talking about the ones that was crucified, the one that put the nails in his hand, the ones who spit on him, the one who healed, and they still say crucified. Praise him one minute, and then they say kill him. Because he didn't operate on their agenda of what they wanted. He had, he had focus, he was focused on what his role was here on earth. And he was fulfilling everything he was set to do. Lord have mercy. And this was a fulfillment on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And they defi divided uh, up his clothes by casting lots. Another fulfillment mentioned in the Old Testament. The people still watch and the rulers smeared. Here's the story. Here's the story. They smeared at him and they said these things. He saved the others. Let him save himself if he is God, the Messiah, the chosen one. Lashing out harsh words at him. That's what they were doing. And the soldiers also came unto him and mocked him and offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. They were looking for a sign from the one who was king. He was our king. But the people, the world, we're looking for a son. The world is still looking for a son. You got believers still looking for a son. But they didn't see what he was trying to accomplish and did accomplish on the cross. I say again, it's not what it looks like. There was written a notice above him on the cross in the red, this is the king of the Jews making mockery of our Lord and Savior. And one of the criminals who hung there, this is what I want to get to, was, it says one of the criminals was, who hung there hurled, hurled ins, insults at him. It says one of them. Aren't you inside? If you are, save yourself and us. But this is what I want to show you. I mentioned to you last week that in the book of Matthew, if I can get to it, here it is. In the book of Matthew, this is a different version of the same story. And it reads like this, verse 41. And likewise, also the chief priests, the chief priests mocked him and the scribes and the elders saying, this is what they said. He said to others, himself he cannot save. If he the king of Israel, let him now come down. Let him come right now off that cross. And then we'll believe. Now you probably say if I were living back then, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done that. I, 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 we'll have that a little bit later. <laughs> he trusted, verse 43. I, this is what I need to look at. Come on, pay attention. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, excuse me, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Here's the verse I want you to see. The thief also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in their teeth. Verse 44 said, The robber who had been crucified with him also began to insult him. It says the robbers, both of them. I told you one had a change of heart. 
We're going to skip over this real quick. I can't stay there. i got to get to where I'm going tonight. But both of them at one time said the same thing. Book of Luke, it said one. But in the book of Matthew, it said both of them at one time. Because when you get into a situation as close as death, those thieves were saying, my time is winding up. When your time is winding up, we get careless. We, we, we get to reaching for everything. We want to talk to man. We want to talk to a psychiatrist. We want to talk to a root man. We want to talk to a, a palm reader. We, want to, we get desperate, and we go reaching for answers. We go looking for somebody to rescue us. So I'm not mad at the other thief, or both of the thieves for saying, if you be God, get us down. Because I probably would have did the same thing. But it said one of them had a change of heart. And, and, uh, and the Bible says, faith come by hearing. And hearing that of the word of God. We talked about it last week. Hearing the word of God is so powerful. That's the reason why believers, we need to talk different. We need to act different. We need to study our word. So when we speak in our conversation, if it's allowed, you can't, I ain't telling you to go on your job and be preaching. No, I ain't, I'm not telling you that. But when the doors open, the opportunity presents itself. Because the Lord will always make a, a, a open a door for those who seek in Him. He said, they that seek and thirst after righteousness shall be fed. There's a lot of people out there that don't know Christ, but they're looking for a Savior. They're looking for a safe haven. They're looking for somebody who knows how to get me out of the mess I'm in. They done spent money. They done went to classes and, and training. And they still feel miserable inside. They feel like giving up, like their life is over. But I come to tell you, it's not what it looks like. The two thieves that said, the robbers, both of them, who have been crucified with him also begin to insult him in the same way as the others. But one had a change of heart because of what he heard. Hearing the word of God changed his behavior, his mindset. And he said, wait a minute. While I was out there stealing, while I was out there taking, this man was out there healing. Delivering, offering care, providing, protecting, being the voice, showing them the way, opening up a door for them who couldn't see. The woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, sick, spent all her money. He was out there healing people, raising Jairus' daughter, doing all these things, cleansing the leper. He said, I heard about him while I was in my sinful state. And I deserved to die. Thought about it. When you get to your kingdom, because somebody doing great things like that, I believe you have a kingdom that you're going to. When you get there, he said, remember me. The power of those words, remember me, makes me think about my life. Ought to make you think about your life. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, cried out, Lord, I know I deserve to die. But Lord, remember me. I know I made some bad decisions. And I keep making them over and over again. I'm talking to the unsaved as well as the believers. Call out to him. Because he will hear you. He heard me. He heard my cry. He sent somebody my way. Told me about him. I accept them as my Lord and Savior. And here I stand today, knowing if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side. I know where I would have been, but I'm not there because it not, it's not what it looks like. He wasn't defeated on the cross. That was a victory. That was the beginning of his victorious journey. And it set us free. All right, let's get going. Here it is without faith. Hearing without faith, Romans 10, 17. So then, faith come by hearing. That's what one of the thieves did. And by him hearing, it changed his behavior, changed his mindset, it changed his view. One of the thieves on the cross exercised his faith based on what he had heard about Jesus. We talked about the observation. Your observation of your situation is not like the Lord's. Observation, the action or process of observing something or someone carefully. He observed us. He watched us. He chose us. 
He chose us. He chose us because he knows us. The problem, the question I had, do you know him? We talked about his thoughts and ways and not like ours. It's not over. It's not what it looks like. We talked about Jairus and his daughter, how Jesus raised him. And, and during the process in this chapter, Matthew chapter 9, the woman also was healed from the issue of blood. Uh, we talked about that. Jesus seen a different outcome. When Jesus look at our life, he see a different outcome. We got to start looking through the lens of Christ. We are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care. I don't care if your finance is not right. I know him as a deliverer. I tell this story quite a bit. I remember when I first got saved, uh, so excited about the Lord. I was purchasing my house and uh, didn't have the good credit that I deserved, but uh, I still went for it because I was moving by faith. I got saved. I was, it was, the pastor was teaching about faith and having faith in God no matter what. And, and I said, here I am renting this house and, and everybody was buying a house. I said, buy me a house too. So the house that I was renting, it was up for sale. And I remember having a realtor from Century 21, Joan Florian, I know her name. Uh, she was a blessing. She helped us get the paperwork together. And we make a long story short, put everything together, turn in my information, and she said, there's one thing showing up on your credit report that's preventing you from getting your house. And she said, I don't know what it's going to take to be able to remove it, but here where you owe um, unemployment some money. You owe some money. Wasn't much, but I owe some money. And what I did when I got laid off between jobs, because I had a family, because I wanted to take care of my family, I wanted to be the man of my house. When I did get a job, I collected two more checks instead of telling them I had a job. I, I know I know what did that, but there's a price I had to pay. Okay, I got penalized. And that showed up on my credit, and there was a balance. Uh, some money there that need to be paid before I can get approved for house. I know where I'm going here. I'm telling you, it's not what it looks like. I got bad news. He said, that, um, there's no way you can kind of clear this in the time frame you're looking to buy your house. She said, I don't really know what advice to give you, but see if you can dig into it and find out what do you need to do to correct it. So I'm going to tell you, I was moving by faith. I was excited. I, I can't tell you then that I knew what I was doing. But I was trusting God. I knew God had spoke to me. And God will ask you to do something that might look crazy to the world. I need somebody listening to me. I did something that wasn't normal. I sat down on my knees, got down on my knees, on the couch, and I got me a yellow piece of paper and a pencil. And I wrote a letter to the unemployment office. And I said, to whom it may concern? I was down in the profession. But I was doing it in pencil on the yellow piece of paper. And I said, to whom this may concern, by no means did I try to take advantage of the unemployment system. I said, but to take care of my family and make sure there was food on the table and they had a roof over their head, I would do it the same way, not reporting that to make sure my family was taken care of. And I signed it off sincerely, Gary Mack, and I turned it in. Because I was speaking from my heart, and I believe I was led by God. I know now that I was led by God, but I was moving by faith about something I heard taught in this church. And I exercised. So what am I getting at? I'm, I'm going to get back to my story. What I'm getting at, the, the thief didn't deserve it. He didn't know Jesus Christ. He didn't walk. He didn't fellowship or witness. He had just met him. I just got to know the Lord. And by faith, taking his word, taking him at his word, and stepping out on faith, I did that, and I wrote it, and I folded it up, and I mailed it to the unemployment office. And then weeks later, Joan uh, from Century 21 called me. She said, I don't know what you did. I don't know what you said. But all I know, they cannot find nothing on your credit report. I come to tell you that faith come by hearing. And it doesn't matter what status you're in, how long you've been serving the Lord, or how long you've been reading and studying your word. If you trust in God, 
I would trust in him and I did what he asked me to do. Several times the Lord asked me to do something that might look crazy to you. Told me, I told you last week, he told me to raise my hand right in the hospital and begin to pray in front of the nurses. And my goddaughter, blood began to come out so they could properly diagnose her from what she was going through. But what I forgot to tell you all last week, as I was praying, I told you I put my hand down and the blood stopped. And I said, Lord, forgive me. We get big headed. We think we're doing it. And it's the Lord. I'm not going away from my text. I'm just letting you know it's not what it looks like. And I threw my hands back up and I get to pray. And they said, the blood is coming out. But after that, one of the nurses said, I've been having problems with my neck. Can you pray for me? His purpose for dying on that cross gave you and I power to be able to make a change in somebody else's life. There's connection here. When we do what the Lord tells us to do, when we operate in our purpose, while we're helping others, I believe God was helping my children. I believe the Lord was watching over my grandchildren that wasn't even here yet, was on their way. God was opening doors for me because I stood on his word and I trusted in him. As a babe in Christ. Then as I mature in the word and begin to see all these issues that go on with believers and those in church, then I had to realize that even though I was saved, the problem won't go away. You still going to have some issues. You still going to have some roadblocks. You still won't have some deaths in your life. Just because somebody died in your life don't mean God stopped loving you. Don't, be, don't believe, it don't mean that his purpose was in vain. All it does is give you more scripture that the Lord, will, he brought me through that, he'll bring me through this. Good God of mine. She said, I don't know what happened, but there's nothing on your credit report. I was able to purchase my house. That was in 1996. And four more years, my house will be paid for. So I'm giving God praise for what he done back then. And he done so many other things in my life. And I know he's done the same for you. It's time to quit playing church. It's not what it looks like. How many times God got to bring you out for you to know that he's on your side? The 10 lepers, 10 were healed. Luke 17, 11, and 19. But one went back to say that only one. Outcasts. Forbidden to come around people. Pain in your body. Limbs falling off. And the Lord make you whole. And only one came back to say thank you. We got to do better. It's not what it looks like. There's a a song I was listening to, I listen to quite often. It's about, uh, it's by um, Kalante Gavin called "Hold Me Close," and I like the you know the melody and the music. But one day I sat down and I looked at the lyrics. And y'all don't mind if I, I can't sing. I'm not gonna sing, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna read it. But this this really messed me up because um, I, let me read. This has a song called "Hold Me Close." It says, I don't want to keep singing and keep sinning. I don't want to live for you and not see you in the end. I don't want to know your name and you not know mine before I get to the game. I'm going to read more, but that... As believers, I, I stand behind this sacred desk and I, I, I deliver the word to you, hopefully to encourage you, to build you up, to get you excited about getting back into the word and to, to, to be a part of a Bible study that believe in hope in Christ, believing that God can make a way or he can give you the strength to get through anything. That's, that's our purpose. That's my purpose tonight, to be able to speak life into a dead situation in your life and realize that it's not over. But during that journey, you got to think about you. you. You got to start as a believer, start to look at who am I? Have I got so comfortable in this, this arena of salvation and, and churchism that I've forgotten the power of his love, of his death, his burial, and resurrection? 
And I told y'all last week, this is not a good Friday message, even though it might sound like it, but it's something that needs to be talked about a little more often, what Christ did instead of what we've done. In this song, it messed me up. He said, I don't want to keep singing. I mean, I, I have a gift. You gave me a gift to sing and keep singing. I, I come to let you know because of our human behavior, we, we want to talk about optimism. I, I, I showed you a little uh, segment that we're going to go to that. Optimistic, thinking positive, getting the job done, saying no matter what negativity come my way, I still believe there is a way out. Our human behavior is a part of who we are. We, we can't get away from that. But sometimes our optimistic of a situation can be a fairy tale as well. But I come to tell you the word of God is no fairy tale. A human behavior, they, they put a name on it, optimistic. You want to think positive. You want to uh, be around positive people. You, don't, you want to give up. You want to say, there, I believe there's a better way. That's great. I encourage you to be optimistic. Pessimistic is the opposite of that. Somebody who's always talking negative. I say, you know, everybody in this room knows somebody over the airway. You know somebody that's optimistic, always believing in the good, always say well, there's a way out. Sometimes they get on your nerves, especially when you're going through. And we have to be honest. Sometimes an optimist who always smiling and giddy all the time, they always got these good things to say when you hurt it. When you know lost what you feel is everything you had. When you feel, even though it's not over, do you feel because of your situation that it's over? Sometimes we don't want to hear that encouragement word. We don't want to hear somebody being bubbly when I'm hurting, when I just lost something or something was taken from me or I've been mistreated or something was done. I'm talking to somebody here. I'm trying to encourage you to let you know it's not what it looks like. But your mind, the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and wickedness and darkness. But you got to remember, did you take on those forms? Do we, do we give the enemy the foothold that he wanted to be able to place these thoughts in our mind that cause us, that cause us to stumble? And that op optimistic or uh, uh, thinking positive all the time is good. But if you don't have no faith and belief behind it, it can be very confusing. It can, it can be very uh, challenging and cause you to trip up and to be smiling and, and witnessing to somebody when you really have no faith in your heart. Singing. He said, I don't want to keep singing and keep sinning. Because I believe we keep sinning because at times, based on our situation, we not, may not think at times that God can get us out. We don't think God cares about us. Do he really hear my prayer? Is he really concerned about me? Is he too busy doing other things? We talked about last week about the killing and the shooting of the young man going to the wrong door, the young uh, girl running to the yard and, and getting shot. Her parents were shot as well. And lo and behold, some more shootings. It's not going to go away. It's not going to go away. And in this life, in this body, you're going to have to make a choice. Even though you have a human behavior, be optimistic or pessimistic. You can talk negative about it, or you can talk positive about it. But you better have some faith behind it. You better stand on something that lasts. And like I told you last week, if you can look at the picture again, I want to go back to it. Jesus is in the center of two thieves. And if you, when I, when I do marriage counseling, when I talk to couples and encourage them to uh, a biblical counseling, let them know if they want a marriage to work, you need to place Jesus Christ in the center of your relationship. He needs to be into, in the center of your heart. He needs to be in the center of your mind. Uh, Romans 12, be transformed, pressured by the renewing of your mind. You need to think different. But the only way you're going to think different, you got to allow the word to have its place in your mind. So you can begin to think different and act different. Back to this song. He said, I don't want to live for you and not see you in the end. That, that, that's one of the parts that got me. That I'm standing here witness to you and 
and and and won't get a chance to see God in the end because I want to put on a show. I want the people to think I'm more holy than I am. Wanting that pat on the back, want to be encouraged by man instead of pleasing God. That's what we got to be careful of. That we don't step on people's hearts in church, outside of church, and claim that we're Christians. Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. But those lost is someone who was looking for some help. They wanted to change. The perfect example of the two thieves, the foundation scripture, the scripture that I built the, the title off of, one of the thieves didn't want it. He was selfish. He remained selfish. But the other thief said, Lord, remember me. He had a change of heart. And he realized what was going on around him. He realized that the one that was in the center of us, they could find no fault because there was no fault in him. Back to the song. He said, please hold me. Help the hook. Please hold me. Hold me close. Please hold me. Hold me close. And the second part of the lyrics, he said, and I don't want to keep preaching and not believing. Hear me. We talk about the optimistic mind or optimistic mindset or the behavior. You have a positive attitude. You look healthy in front of other people. But if you don't have no faith in God, he said without faith, when our Hebrew scripture, you know Hebrew, Hebrew, the, the book of faith, he said without faith, it is impossible to please God. I'm going to go on. I'm going to get off this song. But this song really blessed my soul. He said, I don't want to keep preaching and not believing. I don't want to keep running and tripping over my sins, myself. I don't want to know your name. This is the one got me. I don't want to know your name, Jesus. And you don't even know mine. That's a question my grandma used to ask us. We said, well, why don't you go to church? Oh, yeah, we believe in Jesus. We, you know, we should throw that, you know, after my mom passed away and my dad, you know, my dad was working and pastoring. And, you know, we, we started skipping church because mom was living, mom made sure we was in church. Dad, we had, like, we was working, we had something to do, and, you know, we wasn't coming to church. As long as we was in this room, we had to go to church. When we got older, we stopped going to church. Grandma, you said, well, why you don't want to go to church? You've been brought up. You know who the Lord is. He the one kept you. The very job that you had, the very air you breathe, the Lord provided for you. And I remember she used to always say this, hey, you, you say you know him, but do he know you? At the time, when I was living in sin, I didn't understand what she was talking about. But in the last days, he would ask you, have you been faithful over anything? Have you kept my word? Did you do what I asked you to do? And he said, he will make you a ruler over many. But also, he said, some of you might say, I don't even know you. I never knew you. Meaning you never had a relationship with me. And what scared me the most, it should scare you, the Bible was written for those that believe, for instruction, for reproof, for to get us back on track, and to make sure we got strength and provision to know what God expects out of us and how we should treat others, and most of all, how we should worship him. The word of God was written for us. When he said, I don't know you, he was talking to those who might have thought because they treated people. Because they had this bubbly attitude. They were, they were optimistic about different things in their life. And instead of putting faith on the word, they wanted to put their human behavior in front of faith. Don't get confused when it comes down to these positive things that go on in the world. They're helpful. They are tool. They help us discover who we are. Or you're a pessimist, or you're a trusted, or you envy, you're jealous of anybody. These are the things the enemy uses, the tools that the enemy uses to trip us up and cause us to stumble. Our human behavior, we mentioned, a study on human behavior has revealed that 90% of the population can be classified in these four groups. And I went over the groups, just talked about the first one, optimistic. It says, don't ignore the problem, but pretend or pretend. You don't ignore the problem, or do you pretend that life is perfect? You admit that. It's not perfect. But you choose to focus on what is good 
about your situation and what they can do to make things better. Great. Having confidence in yourself. Having confidence in others. I can make it. But if you don't put Christ in the center, I know where I'm going. Christ paid it all for us. If you don't include him into it, all you are is an intelligent human without Christ. Don't get in a state. Why should both optimistic and pessimistic be in your job search? Rather be on a job or your job here at church. Because an optimistic person or a pessimistic person, you need both. Because we would have never found Christ and didn't realize the sin that we were in. And sometimes the first thing we look at, any situation that's going on in life, the first thing that comes to my mind is negative. We want to over-exaggerate. We want to over-emphasize our pain. We want to we want to give up on life. So if you got a bad report, we're going to say, woe is me. I'm dying. Doctor didn't say you were dying. Just gave you a bad report. The bad report means you might have to change your diet. You might have to exercise. You might have to stay away from certain things. You might need to go out more. You might need to be more friendly. You might need to change your views and your thoughts to be able to change the atmosphere. But most of all, you better know to get into your word, the word of God. Because the word of God, he said, it would not return unto the void. Meaning go out with power. He said, it's sharp than any two words sword. Meaning anything that it come up against, it can cut through. That's the power of his word. And you got to know that. As a believer, you got to know that the power of God's word is powerful and it can make a change in your life. Whether you got a positive attitude or a negative attitude. Uh, uh, pessimistic. Pessimism can be described uh, as a tendency to think negatively. A person who is pessimistic may frequently identify and focus on the negative or the unfaith. We talked about that. I want to go to the story of Job. If you're looking at somebody who was optimistic, um, I think Job is one of the better characters that you can find. Job lost everything. God said in Job chapter 1 that Job was a man that lifted him up, that honored him, that worshipped him, that esteemed God. He praised Job. And if you drop down to the sixth verse of Job chapter 1, it says that the sons of God were walking around and Satan. And God called Satan and said, I need you to go test my servant, Job. Test. God picked Satan. He picked the devil. He grabbed the devil and said, I need you to go test my servant. I need to go put some pressure on him. And Satan said these words to God. He said, that's not a problem. But there's only one thing. I can't touch Job. Because your hands is all over him. Your blessing is a fence around him. I'm talking to somebody here. Sometimes in your life, even though you're saved, even though you know you've been protected by God, there's some things that might come your way. I'm not saying God is going to test you like he tested Job, but there's some things that are going to happen in your life that might trip you up or set you back. But what I love about Job, if you want to target him with the, uh, or give him a title saying what kind of attitude he has, we want to say he was optimistic, you can go ahead and say that. But I want to say he trusted in God. He had faith in God. He knew that even though what he prayed for was falling apart, he said he lost his cattle, he lost his camel, he lost his sheep, everything. He was a rich man. He had, he had riches because God had blessed him because he stood upright in God's eyes, in God's sight. But God still chose for him to be tested. Tested. Tried with fire. After being stripped of everything that he had, but his wife, rich is gone. All of his children gone. You know the story. I don't have to overemphasize. It's written. It's in there. After all that he had been through, Job was stripped 
And he said, these are the words that Job said. You talk about optimistic. I said, a man full of faith and trusting in God. Job said these words. He said, naked I came into this world. And naked I'm going to return. Blessed be the name of our God. But before Job said that, he wrapped his clothes and he shaved his head. And the Bible said he worshipped. At first, being pessimistic in my thinking, I'm thinking that that worship meant Job was cursing out God and said, Lord, why are you doing this to me? But when Job said, naked I came into this world and naked I leave, that let me know that Job truly went into a worship. Of saying, Lord, I might not have been a good steward over that because I prayed every day and I didn't put my trust in you. Even though he trusted him, he still didn't trust God enough. What I mean enough, when you ask God for something, you got to believe that God is going to do it. I'm not telling you you can't go back and keep praying for something. I encourage you to do that if that's what you feel to do. But when you get a relationship with God and you know he knows what's going on inside your heart and inside your mind. Y'all got to hear me here. You got to get to the point because I haven't always been there. But there's times where I know, Lord, I can't even open my mouth to say what's going on, but I know you know. He said he would under, he can understand how he said the Lord be our, our, our mediator between us and the Father. The Holy Spirit speak us on our behalf and let him know how firm is our pain. And he speaks on it. Let God know what we're going through. I believe when you get in that all sincerity and knowing who God is and trusting him with everything that you have, all your heart, and you lean not to what you think, Proverbs 3 and 5, and you trust in him. And I believe God will begin to direct your path. He will begin to show you his power, his love. Naked I came into this world, Job said. And naked I shall return. Blessed be the name of our God. Wow. God tested him. God kept him in a situation. For a time period, he allowed Satan to touch him, but not kill him. You got to know the enemy that's been chasing you and coming at you. If he get a chance to touch you, if he get a chance to touch you, he can do some serious harm. But you don't have to fret if you're connected to the one I've been talking about here tonight. It's not what it looks like if you can't stay connected. Don't visualize him on the cross. Visualize him getting off of that cross. Or visualize him going to the bottom of the earth and preaching the word and ministering to those who didn't hear the word of God. Imagine him or picture him snatching the keys of death and hell in the grave out of Satan's hand and taking them up and marching it says, when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was torn. Rocks were split. It got dark. All these events took place when he died. It says, the dead who were in grave began to stand up and walk. They were walking around. Dead people walking because there was power in his name. There was power in his blood. There was power in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's not what it looks like. It wasn't what it looked like then, and it's not what it looks like in your life. It's not over, somebody. It's not over. My little clicker is falling apart, but I'm going to fix it and keep on clicking. Our behavior pattern, just because just because we say don't mean that we exempt. So we talked about the being optimistic, pessimistic. We talked about, we haven't talked about trusting. That's what we're going to hit on next week. Trusting and being envious of somebody else. Being envious of what somebody else has. 
A lot of times we, we waste a lot of time missing our blessing trying to get what somebody else has. That's being envious. That's the type of behavior that stops you from hearing from God. That's the type of behavior, human behavior, that prevents us from moving forward in the gift that God gave us. God told us the gift that he gave me. He gave one five, he gave one two, he gave one ten. Excuse me, one. And the one who had one took his gift and hid it. So meaning what God has given him, God gave him the gift. And you take what God gave you and you hide it. But the ones, the one who had five and ten, they invested. They put feet on what God had given them. They put their mind, their human mind, they put their hands, they put their, they put their mouth, they were able to encourage others, and they invested in themselves, and they were able to double or triple their investment. Meaning when you do what God called you to do, when you know that it's not over and not what it looks like, you begin to minister with confidence. So when you tell people how God brought you out, they ought to feel a change. They ought to feel something in the room when you speak because you belong to him. And, and if the Lord is in you, there ought to be evidence through how you live and how you speak and how you live. There ought to be some changes happening in your life. Every. What are the three behavior patterns of a human? And I'm closing with this. In scientific research, human behavior is a complex an interaction of three components. Your actions, your thought, and emotions. And all that is is how you act. Your reaction when a situation occurs. You got to do like Job did. He said he ripped his clothes. He shaved his head. Meaning he was hurt. He was in pain. He was experiencing real pain. But one thing Job did immediately. He began to worship God. Because he knew who was in control. He knew what God gave me. He said, Lord, you brought me in here naked. I came in with nothing. And I'm going out with nothing. But I know as long as I stay connected to you, I know there's going to be better days. As long as my, if my children are gone, if everything, all my resources are gone, instead of you, Lord, as long as I have you, I have everything that I need. I want to encourage somebody tonight that you have everything you need in him. So we're going to talk about next week in our closing. Next week in our closing, we're going to talk about these three things. The way we act, the way we think. Act is your action when the situation occurs. How do we think? How do we process our situation, our current situation again, or what we might be facing, and how we feel? These all affect our praise. These, these three can increase your praise, and they also can be a stumbling block for your praise. How do you deal with it? Your actions. How you react to your situation. Do you panic? Do you overreact to bad news? Do you shut down and push others away? My question to you as I close. He came to seek and to save those who are lost. He saved us. He rescued us. And he asked us to be imitators of him. Because we connected to him. Our message ought to be his message. Love, peace, joy, forgiveness, long-suffering. We ought to have the same message that our Lord and Savior. And for those out there that don't know him, he came just for you. He went through all his suffering for you. But that wasn't the end of the story. He got up with all power in his hand. The victory belonged to him. And if you accept him, it belongs to you. I want to thank you for spending time with me this evening. Thank you for opening up your hearts and minds to hear what the Lord had to say. Next week in our closing, we're going to be talking about these three things, your thought process, but also we're going to be celebrating the victorious journey that our Lord and Savior took, and we're going to rejoice in the victory that we have as believers. Can we give the Lord a praise? God bless you. I am Pastor Gary Mack here, Shallow Baptist Church, one church in two locations. See you, Pastor the Reverend Dr. James Allen Duncans. God bless you. I love you until we meet again.